I have a very important question I'd like to start with this morning. How many of you like to be told what to do? Do you like to be told when to do something, where to do something, why to do something, or how to do something? If you're anything like me, then the answer is no, perhaps a resounding no. And let me give you a small example of this. As you all know that uh, infants, well, they don't feed when the rest of us eat. Usually, most of us eat about three times a day or so, or two times a day. Or, I mean, we have a set schedule. Well, infants, on the other hand, it's whenever they're hungry. And admittedly, Jacob has gotten much better since we first got him. But he still wakes up about 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning hungry. Well, Carla is oftentimes more than happy to get up with him. She will go over, and she'll get the bottle. She'll take him in her arms. She'll feed him. She might change him, and she'll rock him back to sleep. Sometimes... Carla is awful tired. She'll lay in bed next to me and she'll say, wake up. She'll push me a couple times, wake up. And sometimes it takes a third, wake up. And, and she'll ask me to go feed Jacob and take care of him. And it's not that I mind taking care of him, but I don't like getting out of bed and go doing what she told me to do. Okay, so you all can relate to this, huh? Well, we all can think of times in our lives where we're told to do things we don't want to do. Where we're told to, that we have to do something in a specific time frame. We have to do something outside of our normal rhythm. We're told you have to do this and you have to do it now. And we don't like that very much. And that's exactly actually what happened in our gospel lesson today, isn't it? Here we have the disciple. And maybe you didn't catch this because it's you know, commonly used in our English language. But we have it started off with a, with a phrase, immediately. Now, if we were in Mark's gospel, that'd be okay. We're used to seeing immediately every two verses in Mark's gospel. Not quite that often, but we're used to seeing it. However, in Matthew's gospel, when immediately comes, well, it sets us off for a minute. It makes us catch our mind. And then you see the very next phrase. He made them get in the boat. The disciples had to do something they really did not want to do. And let's point, paint the picture of where they were at. What was going on for them right at that particular point? It'd been a long day, hadn't it? They'd been outside with the rest of the crowds all day long as Jesus was preaching. They had distributed all the food for the 5,000 plus people, right? They had picked up all the food for the 5,000 plus people, right? They were tired. They were weary. They didn't have the promise that Jesus was going to go with them as they crossed the lake. They were getting into the boat. And not only that, we find out as we read just a little further, don't we? that it was no easy time. There were storms that had come up, and they were rowing against the storm. So life was not easy for them. We probably had 12 guys who were sitting there grumbling to themselves, saying, I don't want to do this. Wouldn't it have been easier to wait till tomorrow morning when we all could have gone together? So here we have the stage set. Our disciples out in the middle of the lake. And it's the middle of the night. And we have Jesus who comes walking across the lake. Now, before we go on, let's talk about that for a minute. They'd been rowing all night. They'd been weary. We find out it's the fourth hour, the fourth watch of the night. That means it's just about dawn. Here they are. They've been working so hard. They're exhausted and they're tired. So your life ever feels that way? Do you ever feel, not, not necessarily weary from rowing a boat, but do you ever feel as though the winds of life continue to blow against you? You have your future set, your retirement planned, your plan for children and grandchildren, your plan for your financial well-being and your future. But those winds of life start to blow. And at first it's not bad, right? You can push against those winds. You can row a little harder. But as those winds start to blow, uh, blow harder, as they start to sweep you up a little more, you slow down to a crawl. And it makes it hard, doesn't it? Because it seems like those future, that future, that plan that you had all set in place, like it's going to be harder and harder to reach, that your destination seems to get further and further away. Maybe you start to look at it and say, wouldn't it have been easier just to walk around the lake, to go around instead of going across this lake, facing these various troubles, these trials? We have some encouragement in our gospel for today. We have some encouragement as we face those those trials, as we face those waves in life, as we face those winds. And that is to keep going. To keep going because we're not doing so alone. 
We're not taking that trip across the lake by ourselves. Now, at first, we may think so. At first, we may look at our lives and say, this is not how I had planned things. This is not how I intended things. But Christ is always with us. He's always there right beside us. In fact, he reassures us, like I said in our gospel today. I don't know if you caught that. But he used a phrase that we, we would pass right over in English. Ego me. Well, that's the Greek version. But it just is translated I. But there's something about that ego me that shows up right there. See, as Jesus came out to them, as he came out to their boat, as they were in the middle of the lake, they heard his voice. And they heard that ego me. And it meant something to them. Because way back, way back, many centuries before this, in Exodus chapter 3, someone else had used those words, ego me. When Moses asked the Lord, what shall, who shall I tell the people sent me? How did the Lord respond? He said to tell them, I am has sent me. Ego a me has sent me. And so when Jesus said, Ego a me, it is I. Take courage. Do not be afraid. They knew that the I am, the Lord, the Lord who is outside of time, the Lord who is outside of, our, of place, the Lord who is in all places and all time was with them. And in much the same way, he is with us. Even as we face these trials of life, as we face these, these various waves, these various winds. And we know that nothing happens by accident. Sometimes, sometimes we look at things and we, we're not sure. We're not sure exactly that we know where to go. That we know what to do. That we know if we can still paddle our boat even. But we know that all things happen according to God's plan. We know that God has set out before us a plan for our lives. That just as he pushed those disciples into the boat, as he pushed them to go out to the middle of the lake, he pushes us into different places, into different times. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, Paul tells us, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Sometimes when we're in those spots, husbands and wives, Mothers and fathers, children and grandchildren. Sometimes when we're in those positions, sometimes God has pushed us into those positions that we, that He can guide us, so He can lead us. But those disciples were probably pretty tired, weren't they? Those disciples were probably pretty tired as they'd rode all night. We'd be pretty tired, wouldn't we? And so we have another promise from God. In fact, this is, this is one of my favorite psalms, and I encourage you to read this one a little later if you have a, little, a chance to read the entire thing, thing. But Psalm chapter 46, and verse 10, David writes, Be still, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still. Be still. Be still in those times of your life when you're exhausted. I'm not talking physically exhausted because we can rest. We can lay down and we can recover. But I'm talking about those times when you're spiritually exhausted. I'm talking about those times when, you, when you're emotionally exhausted. When you feel you've cried every tear you have to cry. I, when, you're, when you feel like you've said every prayer you have to say. Be still. Be still and know that the Lord, the Lord is God. That He is in control. That all things fall under His command. Now as the disciples, as they saw Jesus walking out to them that night, as they saw him, what was their response to him? Was his response happiness a joy? No, it was terror. It was fear. It is a ghost, they said. And part of this we can relate to as well. Because we're used to things that we can feel and touch, aren't we? If the disciples had seen Jesus swimming out to them, paddling his arms or even rowing his own boat, they wouldn't have had a problem, would they have? They like things that are natural. They like things they can control. So do we. Think about it. When you turn on the faucet at home, even as hot as it is, you expect water to come out. Now, I admit sometimes the head gate is closed, and if, you're and if your reservoir is empty, then you, water won't come out. But most of the time, water comes out, even in the summer. When you push power on your television set, that screen flashes from black to alive with pictures. When you turn, put your key in your ignition and turn, you expect the car to start. We like things that we can measure. 
things that we control, things that are in our hands. And, and so we, we don't like so much, though, those things that are outside of our control. We like things we can shape, the fact that we can farm land, that we can shape steel. We like the fact that we can use a brush to paint and create a picture. We like the fact that we can shape notes to make music, to make sound. We like that because we can hear it. We can touch that. But we don't like the supernatural so much, do we? And many times we'll try to deny it. We'll try to say, no, no, that's not what that is. A flicker of a light, a, a coolness in a warm room. Because we don't like things that are outside of our realm. But that's exactly what the disciples are faced with, isn't it? They're faced with Jesus. Supernatural. Approaching them. And yet calmly and seemingly with ease, he walks out to them on the water. Not laughing, thinking, I'm really going to get them this time. But, but instead re- saying, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage, it is I. In the same way, he invites us as we face those things in life that are out of our control. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And with that compassionate voice, he calls us to him. He calls us to him. Did you notice that Peter, Peter was sitting there in the boat, he, and, and he said, Lord, if it is your will, you command me to come out of the boat. Jesus didn't say, Peter, you're bold again. Your faith is going to fail. But instead he says, come. He calls him out of that boat, didn't he? He said, come, come out of that boat. Come to me. What an invitation. I imagine as Peter looked over the side of the boat, as he stepped out, he, he probably did so ever so lightly. He, he was barely touching the water at first. And then just as he realized it was hard, he, he stepped with his other foot. And all of a sudden, he's standing firm. He's standing tall. He's trusting the Lord. Oh, how quickly, though, the wind blew his faith away, didn't it? How quickly that wind swept up and took that faith right from him. He started to sink, and he shot up his arm. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Peter took that risk, though, didn't he? He took that risk trusting God's command. How hard is it us, for us sometimes to take that risk to trust God's command? We are given God's command right here. In case you're never sure where, where it's clearly marked, it's right here in His Word. He gives us His Word, and in time and again, He gives us His command. He gives us that command to come. Some of us will take that first step. We'll step out. And our faith may, may, may shake. Our, our knees may tremble. and Our faith may shatter. But we take that first step. But on the other hand, there's those of us who we're not even willing to take that first step. Remember those other disciples. It seems Peter gets the spotlight in this story, but remember those other 11 disciples. They didn't even get out of the boat, did they? They, did, they were scared. They hunkered down. They weren't willing to take the risk. And it, it's no accident that our church is shaped like a boat. I think that sometimes that's exactly how Christians respond. We don't even, we're not even willing to take that first step to step out of that boat. We just want to stay in the boat. It's safe in the boat, isn't it? It's safe when we stay in church. There's not rejection. There's people who's just, who are just like us. When we stay in the boat, we don't have to hear that call, that call, come. And we've even worked up pretty, plenty of good reasons why we shouldn't leave the boat. I can't go. I'm too old. I can't go. I'm too young. I can't go. I, I don't have the physical condition to do it. I can't go. I'll be rejected. I can't. And we have all kinds of excuses why we can't step out. Why we can't come when the Lord calls. But isn't that exactly what he says? Is come. Take that risk. Step out. Step out of what you're used to. Step out of, these, out of what you're, what's normal. Step out of those who always are, are on your side. Step out in faith with me. See, isn't that what this is about? It's about the power of God's word. It's not about Peter. It's not about the disciples, but it's about the power of God's Word. Today we understand it a little differently. But the Word of God in baptism, it's powerful, isn't it? It's not just water, but water and the Word that takes someone from being a dead, rotten sinner to being a forgiven child of God. It's not just, it's not just bread and wine and communion. But it's those two words, for you. For you, our ears hear. And as we receive that bread and wine, we receive that precious gift of Christ's body and blood. Not in the wrath of God, despite the sinners that we are, 
but as an invitation. Come. Come taste and see. I am good. See, that is even the word. It's God's word to us to come. Come be with me in church. Be filled up. Be strengthened. Feel my power. Worship me and find the joy that comes with that. That's the power of the word. The, the come. Come to me. And I, will, and I will reassure you that you may send missionaries to your community, to your world. Come. Come to me. And even as you see your loved ones dying, know that I have called them home to me. Where they will live in life eternal. No. No, it's not about us, is it? It's not about disciples. But it's about the power of the Word. The Word of God. And if you remember that Christmas text we say every Christmas morning, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The Word is God. The Word will be God. I am. I am Christ Jesus who has call, who called us. He is the one. He is the Word who dwells among us. He is the one who never leaves us, who never abandons us. He is the one who carries us through. He is the one who calls us out to step out in faith and trust Him. That we may see that as fearful as life may be in front of us, that as tenuous as our steps may be, that nothing happens outside of His control. That the God who has, who has sa- freed His people from the slavery of Egypt, the God who walked on water, the God who called the wind and the waves under His command, the God whose na- who has nature bow at His feet, that is the God who is our God. That is the God who is in control of our lives, who is in control of our world, and that is the God who invites us to trust Him, to step out in faith, not just to stay in the boat, not just to sit here and get comfortable where we're safe, but to step out. Take that step, and as tentative as it may be, to trust Him. To trust Him and know, truly He is the Son of God. Truly He is the Son of God, who not just calls us out, but who carries us each step of the way. Who carries us throughout these tumultuous seas, that one day we'll join Him in the tranquil, tranquil peace of eternal life. Amen. We pray. Lord, we come to you this day and we know that you are a great God. You are a mighty God. You have called all creation under your command. You have made us, you have designed us uniquely and wonderfully. And Lord, we know that you have a plan for our lives. We pray your guidance each day that we would be willing to step out in fear. Forgive us, Lord, when we, when we're, when we're scared, when the winds of life buffet at us and, and the waves turn us over. Forgive us. Forgive us that we, when we turn from you, may we ever look to you and know that your strength is there for us. That even as those winds and those waves buffet against us, that you reach down and with your almighty grasp, you pull us out. You str- with your strength, you pull us from those seas that we may be back again with you. Lord, pray, we pray that each day that you would guide us, that we would walk in your peace that we walk in your ways and that we would know, that we would know your peace that is greater than all peace. In your name we pray. Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.